All right, well, hello, IFA friends, and welcome back to uh, um, our second town hall series in the uh, IFA franchisee uh, town hall series. My name is Mike Lehman. Greetings from IFA World Headquarters here in Washington, D.C. And again, welcome back to our uh, town hall program offered in partnership with Franchise Update Media. Uh, management extended this series after a successful first episode in week one, so we are back for our second town hall, and today's program is in a series this summer to talk franchisee issues at a pivotal time for uh, the franchising community. And you think of this series as being interesting people talking about interesting issues facing your business, and you get to hear from and ask questions to are expert guest speakers on these town halls. And you can enter questions at any point during this town hall uh, right into the Q&A box on your screen. And we will be glad to uh, process as many of those as we can on the line. Uh, but mainly we're glad you're here because there's perhaps never been more public policy issues coming at the franchise model and franchise community than right now. Uh, we're, we got off to a great start in our town hall series last week. We had former Congressman Rodney Davis, who comes from a McDonald's owning family, as well as former NLRB Chairman John Ring on our first town hall. And this week, I'm joined by three great experts on franchising. You see them on your screen in, uh, in two different ways, Svetlana Gans, Tam Kennedy, and IFA's own Sarah Bush headlining today's program, which in which we will dig into the role of the Federal Trade Commission. We made some fleeting references to the FTC on last week's program, and the FTC, we're going to dig in uh, much deeper today. The, F, the FTC is the federal agency that enforces the franchise rule and is the primary agency that governs franchising uh, nationwide. And we're going to discuss how it affects businesses like yours. And we're going to particularly focus today on the FTC's current request for information, otherwise known as an RFI, into franchise relationships that's currently in public comment. And you may have heard of this. Uh, comments are due June 8th, coming up in two weeks. And we are encouraging every franchise owner to share how important the franchise model is to your livelihood at a time when Washington regulators are seriously considering a number of things that would affect the franchise relationship and, and doing so at several different federal agencies. And what we're gonna do today is, today's town hall is gonna be more than a video call, but we're gonna host a bit of a workshop. We are going to help you write a submission to the FTC on behalf of your business. And we will explain as we go how and why that's important. But if you take out your phones right off the bat here today, uh, we'd encourage you to, as you see the two QR codes on your screen, take a look and uh, scan the one on the right that says submit comments. Uh, because if you do so, that'll take you directly to the regulations.gov webpage where you can submit a comment on what franchising has meant to you, where you can tell your franchise business story. And if you pull that up and email it to yourself, maybe have two different browsers going at once as you listen to this program, we're going to help you write your submission right on the, this call over the next hour so you don't have to think about this again. And again, we're grateful that you're here. The full FTC RFI is on the left um, where you can see all of uh, all the questions and additional context. But uh, you don't have to worry about that. If you don't care to, we'll make it as efficient as possible if you uh, just click the QR code on the right. And again, write your submission while you listen to this town hall. And if you do click on the QR code on the right, it will take you to this page that's uh, on the screen, to the regulations.gov portal, where you can submit a comment of any length. Uh, and what you'll do is you just click on this blue button on your screen marked by the red arrow, and you'll submit a comment. So you, you can do that on a separate browser you can go to that uh, entry box and start uh, typing away 
in the ways that we will uh, uh, hopefully counsel you. And we hope you find this uh, program very, very helpful. Okay, so now on this next screen, we're gonna leave this screen up for the majority of our program here for your reference. So, because if you click on the uh, QR code on the left on your screen, same same pair of QR codes as on the previous screen, uh, that's where you're, you're taken to the RFI that's actually a series of 75 questions. Uh, but we don't, you don't need to get bogged down with them. I don't know if anyone is responding to all 75 questions. Mm -hmm. But instead, for all of you busy running your own businesses, and um, again, we're grateful for your time here today, here is a suggested outline on your screen for a potential four-paragraph response that could be very valuable uh, in submitting right now and standing up for your business. In four paragraphs, uh, you can simply... As it says on your screen, introduce your business and explain why you chose franchising as part of your small business story. You can write about how you and your fellow franchisees communicate with your brand to resolve issues and innovate and perhaps even navigate a global pandemic whenever that arises to in order to remain competitive in your industry. And third, you can write about how and why you want to be an autonomous as an employer, why it's important for you to be an independent business owner and why you went into business for yourself and how franchising accomplishes that for you. And fourth, you can write about how you don't care for government to negatively affect the equity, the investment that you've poured into your business through unnecessary regulation. So we'll talk more about this outline as we go, but we're gonna leave this on the screen and that's our advice uh, for everyone in the simplest way we can make it possible. So, okay, that's my wind up. I introduced the program. Now I'm gonna introduce our speakers. We have a great, great program uh, here today. So in a moment, we will be joined by uh, my great colleague, IFA's general counsel, Sarah Bush, and Tam Kennedy, who is president of Twin City TJ's Inc., which is a Taco John's franchise in the Midwest. She's also a board member of the IFA and a past chair of the Franchisee Forum. But first, you will hear from Svetlana Gans, who is partner at Gibson Dunn here in Washington, D.C. But Svetlana is just the expert we need on this program because she previously served as chief of staff to a former chair of the FTC, and she also served as counsel in both the FTC's Bureau of Competition and the Bureau of Consumer Protection. So, and again, as you listen to today's call, uh, you're encouraged to submit questions that uh, come to mind uh, through the Q&A box, and we'll try to process them as we go. All right, let's get started, and let's start with Svetlana. Svetlana, welcome to today's IFA Town Hall. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. Thank you. So, welcome to the program. Would you tell us a little bit? Uh, gave a hint, but would you tell us a little more about your background and uh, history with the FTC? Uh, sure. Um, so I started my career as an honors paralegal at the Department of Justice Antitrust Division, where I focused on mergers and acquisitions. Um, after graduating from law school, I did a stint in private practice and thereafter went over to the FTC, uh, first in the Bureau of Consumer Protection, where I worked in the Division of Marketing Practices, which is the division that oversees the franchise rule. And then I went to be a attorney advisor for then Commissioner um, Olhausen, where I advised her on all things consumer protection related enforcement and policy issues. Uh, later on, when she was elevated to acting chair, uh, she promoted me to chief of staff of the agency, where I led several initiatives and oversaw an agency budget of 300 million. Um, some of the agency initiatives that I ran included several small business uh, initiatives, including the Small Business Education Initiative focused on privacy and cybersecurity. And I also ran the um, Economic Liberty Task Force, which is designed to reduce government occupational licensing requirements to get the government out of the way of folks uh, getting work in the United States. Um, after I left the agency, I served as vice president of regulatory policy at the Cable Internet Association and now joined Gibson Dunn, focusing on all things Federal Trade Commission. Excellent. We're thrilled you're here. So thank you again. So tell us, what is the FTC? I think a lot of us, have, if we read the newspaper, we've seen the FTC and stories with big tech or perhaps an antitrust case. But well, tell us about the FTC and what's generally going on there right now. 
Uh, sure. So the FTC was established in 1914 as a, a competition agency and later as a consumer protection agency. The FTC's main statute is Section 5 of the FTC Act, which prohibits unfair methods of competition on the competition side and unfair and deceptive trade practices on the consumer protection side. Um, historically, both of these missions focused on consumer welfare and consumer benefits, uh, which has somewhat changed uh, under the Biden administration, which I'll discuss later on. Um, the FTC shares its antitrust jurisdiction with the Department of Justice Antitrust Division, and also shares some consumer protection enforcement activity with the CFPB, which is now run by Rohit Chopra. Um, the FTC focuses on a bunch of things from mergers and acquisitions to monopolization um, on the antitrust side and then on the consumer protection side, they focus on privacy, advertising, marketing, and of course the franchise role. Outstanding, very helpful. So what is unusual, if anything, about the current FTC and, and what would you tell us about the current commissioners that are making decisions there for the agency? So um, I've seen a, a significant shift in the approach of this FTC um, in three main buckets. One is policy changes, two is process changes, and three is rulemaking focus. Um, some examples of this are uh, Chair Khan has centralized the power of the agency in her office. She has authorized individual commissioners to launch uh, public investigations, uh, non-public investigations of certain industries. Um, there, there's been enhanced collaboration between the state attorneys general and the FTC. And the FTC has sought significant budget increases to the tunes of uh, several hundred millions of dollars in order to uh, ramp up enforcement and go beyond um, their statutory authority in several areas. Um, to me, what really sticks out most are two things. One is the agencies now focus on workers and labor issues. And number two, they're focused on rulemaking. Um, so in terms of the focus on uh, workers, it's really been a shift from its historical focus on protection of consumers. Um, uh, this all started earlier last year when the FTC changed its mission statement from the protection of consumers to the protection of the public at large. Um, in addition, for decades, the FTC's mission statement stated that the FTC will go uh, about its business without unduly burdening legitimate business activity. And under Chair Khan, the FTC removed that phrase from its longstanding mission statement, telling us the public that it has no qualms about burdening legitimate business activity with its regulation. Um, in 2022, the FTC announced a memorandum of understanding with the NLRB and has since um, uh, participated as a MIKI in several NLRB proceedings. Um, the FTC's non-compete rulemaking really showcase, showcases its interest in expanding into labor markets uh, as the FTC expressed concern about business coercion of workers and harms to wages. And this RFI that we'll talk about later today really picks up this trend in multiple ways. It states that the FTC is learning, is interested in learning more about the means by which franchisors exert control over franchisees and their workers, and asks six specific questions concerning wages and workers. And all of these questions suggest that the goal of the RFI is to identify paths through which the FTC can advance the interest of franchise system workers rather than the franchise system itself. The second big policy shift, as I mentioned, is the focus on rulemaking. Um, in the last two years, the FTC has sought to promulgate uh, at least seven uh, consumer protection rules uh, covering a whole host of topics from um, earnings claims to service fees to subscription plans. And none of these rules really talk about uh, how the consumer will benefit from additional rules or how the small business community will be working through these rules in terms of the additional paperwork, the additional disclosure and other burdens. So uh, these are definitely areas to watch and definitely a, a difference from when I worked there and historically in terms of the FTC's priority. Um, in terms of you asked about the current commissioners, um, you know, as we know, Chair Khan is a very smart and ambitious lawyer. Um, she was a protege of Elizabeth Warren and Rohit Chopra. Um, she wrote the Amazon antitrust paradox uh, while in law school and also served in the House Judiciary uh, Committee working on big tech issues. 
Um, she has a different view on antitrust law and the role of government in the regulation of marketplaces. Um, she wants the agencies to be more proactive in terms of not only enforcing existing law, but also changing the way the underlying markets function to make them more fair. So this is really a shift in terms of the role of government and the role of marketplaces to uh, regulate themselves. Um, one other note, uh, uh, Rekha Slaughter is a Democrat there and uh, Alvaro Bedoya is another Democrat. So right now the FTC has three Democrats and zero Republicans. Both the Republicans recently resigned. Um, Commissioner Bedoya is very interested in uh, unionization issues and worker um, collective bargaining. Um, and as I mentioned, there now there's just three Democrats, zero Republicans. Commissioner Phillips, the Republican appointee, left in August of last year, and Commissioner Wilson left in um, on Valentine's Day earlier this year um, in what she termed to be her noisy exit. You, you probably saw her um, op-ed. Um, in the paper, uh, Commissioner Wilson, when she left the FTC, expressed grave concerns about Chair Khan's leadership, accusing Chair Khan of, quote, willful disregard of congressionally imposed limits on agency jurisdiction, her defiance of legal precedent, and her abuse of power to achieve desired outcomes, end quote. So there's been a lot of drama at the highest level of at the FTC in the last several months. Svetlana, thank you for translating all that. So thank you. Uh, let's drill down on the franchise RFI. So I think if there's a theme of this discussion today, it's that there, that there are and there always will be disagreements between franchise brands and franchise owners. But at the end of the day, we're all pro-franchising. It's a symbiotic relationship. Franchisors need franchisees. Franchisees need franchisors or there's no franchising. So many of the comments, however, submitted to this RFI so far, Svetlana, are not necessarily supportive of the franchise model. So what's your take? How much does this matter? Is this really a request for information or is there something more intentional going on here? So the, the FTC press release really um, makes clear that the agency is focused on unraveling the franchise or franchisee relationship and has a negative bent and negative spin to the announcement of the RFI. Um, you know, it, it doesn't appear as though the FTC is viewing this with an open mind, which means that public comments are needed to a larger extent to, to try to convince the FTC not to engage in this um, burdensome rulemaking for, for the industry. Um, you know, as you know, the FTC oversees the franchise rule. Um, the franchise rule is generally a pre-sale disclosure uh, obligation where franchisors are required to provide um, various categories of material information to franchisees. Uh, those categories are the nature of the franchise system, the fr franchisor's financial viability, the cost of, of operating a franchise, and so forth. So the idea there is to um, make help franchisees make informed decisions of their investment to become a franchisee and to avoid deception uh, by requiring franchisors to provide prospective franchisees with essential information prior to the sale. What's important about the franchise rule is that it does not regulate the franchisee-franchisor relationship. Hmm. And it's important to remember that during the FTC's last substantive review of the franchise rule, it specifically stated that the agency was not well equipped to govern the specific terms and conditions between franchisors and franchisees, hmm. that it was outside of the FTC expertise. And uh, even the franchise rule itself um, recognizes that there is some control between franchisees uh, and franchisors in order to make the franchising model work. Um, so right now what the RFI is seeking to do is go beyond the franchise uh, rule disclosure obligations and go through the specific provisions of the franchising agreement to figure out where the FTC can do harm. They want to unravel the entire agreement and, and basically out, lay out a quote unquote fair playing field, which may not uh, be a benefit to the franchise system. Um, they want to, they're asking the public to basically submit any anything about the franchise system that's wrong with the franchise system. It's a call for complaints. Uh, no, no complaint is too small. And the FTC's intention is to basically fix everyone's problems, uh, whether it deals with how you source your product or how much you pay your workers. 
But the problem at the end of the day is that the FTC is not the right agency for this. It is not the Department of Labor. It does not have franchising experience. And that is why um, the um, submission of public comments is really important here to educate the FTC on what's really going on on the ground with respect to franchising. Okay, that was going to be my next question, but you now you've touched on it, Svetlana. If if the FTC, if this isn't a true RFI, and the FTC already is headed in a direction, perhaps even knows exactly what's what it's going to do to franchising, what is the importance for a busy franchise person in responding to this? Well, in my mind, there's really three core reasons why someone in the franchising community should submit a comment. Uh, one is um, it will likely be the case that the FTC will impose a one size fits all regulation yeah. that is never good for anyone. Um, these rules are very likely to impede a franchise system's ability to control its own brand. Um, and as you know, the franchise model works because of brand consistency. The lack of consistency of standards will not only jeopardize the franchising system, but it will open up franchisees to liability and consumer complaints and potentially a loss of goodwill and business. The second reason it's important to submit a public comment is because the FTC will likely throw out the baby with the bathwater, right? Um, we don't really expect the FTC to take a nuanced approach to this rulemaking or potential rulemaking. We don't expect the FTC to, to balance um, the nuances of the franchise system. And just by way of example, take the recent uh, non-compete uh, provision, uh, non-compete rulemaking uh, proposal. Um, there's no nuance there. There's no um, kind of thought of reasonable ways to go about it. Mm -hmm. Rather, the FTC seeks to ban all non-competes in any circumstance. Uh, beside, despite the fact that there are some nuances involved and, be, and, and despite the fact that this has been governed by state law for decades, um, the FTC does not believe that non-competes are, are reasonable in any circumstance. Um, even if employees know a lot about your business and want to take your IP and business know-how to a competitor, the FTC says you cannot um, in, include a non-compete in your agreement. Um, take another example, the FTC just issued a proposed rulemaking on junk fees earlier in the year. Um, now, while the FTC is right to protect consumers from hidden fees, uh, the way they're going about it is to restrict a company's ability to charge fees at all. So service fees, late fees, convenience fees may all be banned for, from the FTC because the FTC, in their view, thinks it has no value to consumers. So we shouldn't expect a different approach in this case. I believe there will be perhaps a, an, um, a proposal for a one size fits all regulation that will probably harm the franchising system. And again, you know, FTC is not the franchising expert. It does oversee the franchise rule, but that's a pre-sale disclosure rule. It does not get into the weeds of the franchisee franchise or relationship. So it's it's very important for folks to weigh in with their views. As you mentioned, the, uh, the record is replete with anonymous comments asking the FTC to overhaul the system. And so uh, your comments need to be heard to kind of change the narrative and talk about the positive benefits of the franchise system. You know, what, when I think about this, I really come down to this, which is um, we could all agree that franchising is, is not 100% perfect all the time, right? And nothing is. But what folks have to ask themselves is, would you rather work with your brand and your franchisor on those issues? Or would you rather have the federal government in a heavy handed way control how you operate your business? And if the answer to that is no, I don't want the government to oversee how I run my business, then you should submit a public comment. That's great. Uh, okay, so one more question for you, Svetlana, and then we'll open it up uh, to our colleagues. You've mentioned labor uh, issues uh, a, a number of times. Um, and joint, we talked a lot about the joint employer issue on this program last week, the idea of uh, lawmakers making franchisors liable for the actions of their franchisees and uh, essentially eliminating most of the incentives for both uh, sides of the business model to engage in this, uh, in this uh, community. So while the FTC is welcoming franchise perspectives with open arms here in the RFI, 
and presenting itself as having a franchising's best interests in mind. The FTC, as you've mentioned, has also partnered with the National Labor Relations Board, which is really the source of joint employer policy that threatens franchising. What does it mean in your FTC expertise uh, that the commission has partnered with the NLRB uh, while this franchise RFI is also going on? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't really see the FTC working hard to protect the franchising model. Um, and if you actually review the NLRB memorandum of understanding with the FTC, you'll see that the FTC really wants to protect workers. That's what they talk about in the MOU. They want to protect workers from non-competes, from deceptive earnings claims, from unionization um, restrictions, uh, classification, and treatment issues. So what? The bottom line to me is I think they're working together, um, you know, to overhaul the system that they think is unfair. Svetlana, very helpful. Thank you so much for all that. And uh, if you'll stick with us a few more minutes, uh, we will continue the conversation with you in a moment and get some questions to you from our audience. But let's now welcome in uh, Tam Kennedy and Sarah Bush. Ladies, thank you also for being with us. So, uh, Sarah, maybe before we turn to Tam and really get into uh, the outline on the screen and an RFI response, anything Svetlana mentioned that you particularly want to uh, react to? Um, no, just to to reiterate that um, that we're you know we're in a unique space with respect to this FTC and um and the composition of the FTC and the actions that they're taking I did want to just highlight um one statement that was made in the the government accountability office report that was issued a couple of weeks ago related to the FTC's enforcement of the franchise rule um where where the GAO stated that the extent and nature of franchise relationship problems are unknown because of a lack of readily available statistical reliable data and, and I think that just highlights so much um, the actions that the FTC is taking, not just with respect to the RFI, but with respect to the non-compete and other rulemaking activity that it's taking, um, that it's not grounded in data. And, and that's what we um, very much need to provide um, to support you know, why, why we need to protect the model and, and keep it out of the space of a federal agency that's not interested in making rules that are rooted in data. That's right. Lena Khan, Chairwoman Khan, was pretty candid in two recent congressional hearings that this entire franchise RFI comes from a handful of franchisees going to open commission meetings. Um, and, uh, you know, that those anecdotes are largely why we're here, uh, despite the fact that there's 800,000 franchises out there. Okay. So, um, Tam, welcome to you. Um, will you tell us uh, about yourself and your business before we get into it? Sure, happy to. Thanks for having me. So, Tam Kennedy, Taco John's franchisee, uh, 39 years this year with the brand in one form or another. I started as a secretary making $4 an hour, worked my way up through the company and bought it 17 years later. I'm pretty proud of uh, all that we've accomplished with our brand in the Minneapolis-St. Paul market. Today, operating six restaurants um, day in and day out, representing our brand, representing my communities today on this call, and really um, focused, I think, on looking at the lifespan of my relationship in franchising and why today more than ever, it's important that a franchisee story be told in a balanced way, um, that we look at everything in a through a lens of um, what this business model has done for us and for our families and for our, our communities, I think, too. It's a partnership in the truest sense of the word. And I think the FTC and pretty much any um, government body can't, can't really understand that. They can't attach their, um, their goals to something that doesn't um, really align with them in terms of like the whole purpose and mission behind putting a great brand in every community and having local business owners serve their neighbors in the way that we do. And I know so many people on the call do as well. So a yeah. little bit about me. There you have it. Perfect. Thank you, Tam. Thank you yeah. for being our business owner on the, the program today. And we appreciate you. So why is it important from your business owning 
perspective for franchisees to participate in this RFI right now? So I think a couple of things. One, we've already talked about the number of negative responses, mostly anonymous, that are sitting out there on this site. And everybody can go take a look at those. If I think that to let anybody else take your voice from you and use it as a way to group you into um, a response or, or a representation of what's happening in franchising is a mistake. It's really, it's the antithesis of what franchising is, right? We are all individual operators in multitude of brands. We reflect and represent our own business interests, our employees that we've brought on to work with us and, and develop in our neighborhoods the things that we do in our communities really are a reflection of us as business owners. And same thing here, these comments um, were outnumbered 90% to 10% negative to positive. I did dig in and start looking at some of them. And I'm not, I can't say that it surprises me too much because of the way the RFI went to market and is outlining in the way that it's asking the questions. So for me, I'm just going to say it the way I always do. Everybody that knows me in franchising knows that's kind of how it works. Um, this is a connect the dot play here. There's an end game to all of this. And it's not that that the um, FTC wants um, us to feel as franchisees that we're being heard, or now there's finally a place where we can get some resolution. I don't think that there's any intention whatsoever that that's what this is. This really is about um, policy building. And this technique, along with some of the other agencies that are at it right now, are really set on using these steps to define joint employer so that it will once and for all be the law of the land. And that is where some of this danger comes in for all of us. There's clearly indications, um, even with the um, letter of understanding and some of these interrelationships that we have going on in some of these alphabet um, pieces of the government that they um, have figured out kind of the way around and they're trying to find a way to push back on some of the successes, IFA and some of our other um, great business associations and entities across the country have had in fighting back against like collaboratively making this a, you know, us versus them thing. And so I think that's something to think about is that they, they want to use a collective voice to represent all Clearly, that's not the case, but there's only 300, only 300 uh, responses. We can do better as franchisees. I challenge you. I know you can. And for those that are non-franchisees on the call, you know one. Otherwise, you wouldn't be on the call. And I think that it's fair to say that we want fair, balanced representation and stories um, and anecdotes, if you will. Um, our experiences need to be placed on this for balance. I think that's super important. Um, it's time to act. We have two weeks. It's important that we do this now. That's why the QR codes are on the screen. Super easy to do this. So that's, um, you know, that's what I'm hoping we can get done here in the next little bit is to get people engaged around why we need to have 10 minutes to write something that really is reflective of us as individual franchisee operators. That's great. Tam, so you've already submitted a comment and we hope, uh, Many of our friends on the line and watching this recording uh, over the next two weeks prior to June 8th are doing doing the same. Yours, your response, uh, your comment, uh, Tam, was even more substantive than the four uh, bullets on the screen. Tell us what you wrote in your submission. Sure. So I always start with why I'm proud to be a franchisee. Why did I decide that I wanted to use franchising? as a way to be a business owner. It is super important to me, right? That I run my business as a family business. My son, my sister, others in my family have worked in our company. And I think, you know, that's the goal. That was always my dream. I wanted to be in control of my own destiny. I wanted to have the honor of being a, a independent business owner. And I'm able to do that successfully by taking somebody else's really good idea some structures and processes and putting them in place in my neighborhoods. That is at the essence of, of my response, why it matters to me that I get to be my own boss. What's really important about kind of today's world and why that is, is I want to pick my own employees. I want to develop them. I want to 
I want to watch them turn into future business owners and guide them through maybe their first jobs or maybe their um, gathering work-life experience as they go through college. Whatever it is, we want to partner with that because I really believe in the worker's um, way of turning yourself into whatever it is that you want to be down the road. And we feel like we build that in our restaurants every day. I wrote about why we don't need government in the middle of a contract, right? So I'm not a lawyer, and but I did get one to read through my um, documents with me as we sign these franchise agreements because, you know, if some things can be complicated. There are lots of um, different components to any relationship and certainly a business one should have some structure to it. I think, you know, I appreciate that because there's a contract in place, there's a word that I like to use that I think everybody should, and that's accountability. I know what I'm responsible for. I know the standards I have to hit. I know what I have to bring to the relationship. And my brand knows what they have to provide me. That I think we forget about. In a world where um, we have lessened really responsibility on our actions and activities in the business world, this is important, right? I need my neighbors to do as well as I do if we're in the same brand and my neighbors count on me to follow those same standards. So that accountability, that written document is important. I don't love every sentence of it, not gonna say that I do, but as a tool to guide our behaviors, I think it's super important. Thinking about the government getting in the middle of that contract, not so much. Not, I said this earlier um, to, to Mike specifically, I can't remember the last time the government helped me uh, with anything and made it better in terms of licensing, contracts, permits in my day-to-day -day life. Everything in the last certainly 10 years has become that much more complicated when government starts to touch small business. It's just not what we want it to be. And this will be yet another kind of heavy-handed approach um, to how to kind of regulate this relationship that they really don't have a part in. I talked about um, some things I'd like to see my brand do. And I think all uh, brands should consider. I'm a believer in associations when they're used for the right reasons. I think associations of franchisees are a collaborative communication tool. They can collect opinions and ideas and help guide in partnership with the brand future endeavors. They help vision plan, they help goal set, they help really bring a reality of a day-to-day -day operator to the table when we're talking about investments, reinvestments, things like that. I think, you know, associations should be looked should be looked at as an opportunity to connect on the issues that make a difference to the franchisee body. And I know some franchisors don't like them. Um, we use our association at Taco John's to work with our brand on initiatives. Um, from reinvestment in remodels to um, structuring new franchise agreements as they come to term. And our brand has been very respectful of our association. I think people think that if you form an association, that's a bad thing. I don't necessarily see it that way. I talk about that in my submission. Um, I talk about supply chain visibility. This is a big one out there in the world today. And it's important for me to look at it from both sides. So Supply chain visibility really at the heart of some of the comments that are being listed on this RFI and some of the discussion that's out there in, in some of these forums is about, you know, why does a brand get to receive benefit from coming up with a contract with the third party vendor? Mm -hmm. um, you know, for me, look, I make tacos every day. I try to make this simple for everybody. I cannot go to the market and buy all of the ingredients and paper supplies that I need at the same price that my brand brings to me to buy on the collective. I can't do that. Now, does that mean my brand has to invest in partnerships to help strategically buy against commodities? Probably. I mean, how could they? Otherwise, they're making a lot of calls to a lot of hamburger makers every day, all day. There's got to be a mechanism in place that I think brands use to go out to the market and secure best pricing that they can and so that it can be shared. I know that there are some franchisees that believe that brands hang on to kickbacks. That's the word, right? That's the buzzword. 
I just think that in an agreement, I think it, any agreement that I want to sign, I want to know how much income the brand derives from supply chain relationships. I don't, I don't think that's a bad thing to ask for. I don't think everybody loves to hear a franchisee bring that up, but I just believe that if we're transparent about our financials, which we need to be, we're contractually obligated to, our brand should be as well. And I think the last thing I really talk about just briefly is these um, cost control, the costs that are kind of um, passed on to us that are labor expenses for kind of non-direct labor kinds of things. So things that have changed in our working life, like tech, for instance, um, scheduling tools, back of house software tools, um, all of the different recruiting tools, all of the costs that are associated with these have started to stack up. Right. There's a lot, there's a lot of costs that don't directly affect, they're not directly impacting my labor per se, but they are expensive. The other side of that, which I try to look at all the time, is I have to remain competitive. I have to find ways to talk to meet empl the employees where they're at. And sometimes that means I have to invest in yet another tool to do that. I think, you know. There's some costs there that I think brands need to think about how much they're asking their franchisees to spend every month. Because it, it, our model has changed in terms of what we can expect to have at the bottom profit at the end of the day because of some of these middle expenses. So I know that's a lot, but that is it. That is what I really focus on. Um, in the end, really, that franchising has meant that I can be. Um, a business owner in my community and that while it's not perfect, it has provided me with the system <laughs> and a way to make a living on my own. Yeah, Tam, hugely helpful. And I hope folks were are writing their submissions as you were talking, taking some of those notes, incorporating those into, again, what can be a very brief response and still very valuable. So Tam, I wanted uh, you to start and then Sarah get you in here too. Do you want to walk uh, our listeners through these four points on their screen and just share a little more about uh, the value of what's what's outlined on this uh, in this on the screen here? Sure. Uh, um, and hopefully you you have the comment submission um, form up, and you can easily just type in. Um, the, you know, I I think point one is self explanatory, and it's it's your story. Um, and and your origin story about why you chose franchising and what that journey has been like for you. Um, point two really is just, you know, and, and I want to echo Tam's um, point on the role of franchisee associations and how um, enormously beneficial they can be to the health of a franchise system um, and, you know, a, a way for the system to innovate and maintain a competitive edge, have communications between the franchisees and franchisors, um, and really resolve things in a positive way. And, and part of what IFA is doing um, outside of this, this RFI and just the broader scope of all of the work that we're doing to improve the model is to really shift the narrative and, and educate franchisors on um, how beneficial franchisee associations can be in a franchise system. Um, if your system doesn't have a franchisee association, just how you communicate with your franchisor, how other franchisees in the system communicate with your franchisor, even if it's informal and there's no advisory council or, or anything set up there. Um, the third point is, again, just highlighting what Tim said, um, what it means to you to be able to create the corporate culture within your business, um, within your four walls, and the relationship that you have with your employees. Um, my job in college was with a multi-unit franchisee in Texas, and it was a global, it's a, still a global company, um, but it was such a great experience for me because it's a small it was a small business owner that had, you know, a dozen restaurants and and what that relationship means, particularly in, in the current labor market where there's a huge labor shortage and, and labor is tight. Um, and then the fourth point is just, you know, why, why these practices are important, not to protect the franchisor, 
um, but to protect you and your business from other franchisees in the system that have the ability to hurt your business, hurt you know the relationship that you have in your community and the reputation that you worked hard to build, um, because they're you know operating um, below what what is not only the standards but below what the rest of the system is doing. Um, so that's I hope uh, kind of distills it down. Um, I do want to respond to just one question while I have the floor. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's certainly the opportunity and we would absolutely encourage responses that are authentic and your story that you go in and type into the comment box. If you don't want to do that, we separately have a fan alert that has gone out. Um, and it is, it is very, um, two seconds. It is essentially a, a, a draft of what we have been talking about during this town hall. You can enter your email address and hit submit and it goes into the FTC and your comments are submitted and you'll receive an email confirmation that your comment is submitted. You also can take that drafted um, response, copy and paste it into the comment and adjust it on your own from there. Um, that's it. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Sarah. Yep. So, Tam, I want to uh, build on Sarah's good comments and maybe focus, put a finer point on uh, on bullet three on the screen, and maybe Svetlana will get your take on uh, bullet three here as well. What's your view, Tam, uh, of joint employer, this issue that franchising has faced now for eight or nine years? Because there seems to be increased questioning of how joint employer would impact impact franchise owners, even though we've already seen uh, a, a negative joint employer standard before. So you first, Tam, and then Svetlana. Sure. So um, it was one of the honors of my life to be able to testify before Congress on this case um, uh, for a joint employer several years back. And I and what's interesting is, is what's old is new again, right? It's just kind of the same, um, same philosophy uh, coming at us from a lot of different directions now. Joint employer really um, for me is particularly um, devious in how it's going about plotting now as I see it franchisees against franchisors. We know that um, we're not all as business operators, not all experts in every area. And we look to our brands to give us guidance on systems and structures around the good or service that we um, that we're in the business of selling, right? So Everything from customer service to processes for how to, if you're brick and mortar, signage, how to open, um, regular routines for the day, and certainly um, what a good standard uniform might look like for um, the for the for your business, because it's it is goes to the brand that being brand like means looking uniform. And so when we look at joint employer, some small pieces of joint employer really being kind of amplified over the idea, again, that our brand tells us what to do with our employees. And I, I, I'll i say it, I said it before, it's on the congressional record, that would never happen with almost every franchisee that I know. We are so proud of being our own business owners. And we, nor does my brand want to take the phone call that says we need a closer uh, at seven o'clock on a Friday night holiday weekend coming up. We run our business. Our brand runs it. Um, we have a mutual, uh, a mutually designed purpose uh, together. But um, when it comes right down to being an employer, and that's the key word here, I am the employer of my, my employees. I think they're picking away at this in lots of different ways. There's sentences here and there getting thrown around. And I think Unfortunately, I think that there are some franchisees in some not great systems that are latching onto this as a way to attack a brand that they're unhappy with, that maybe they're partnered with. It's just not the case. I, I, I'll say what I said to a whole bunch of congressmen and women. Um, they, we agreed that the government works for the people. And then I said, would you like me to pick your staff for you? And they did not love that. They did not think that that would be my role. And I said, nor is it my brand's role to pick the employees that work for me. We might have a relationship, but we don't have a joint employer relationship. So 
Um, that's just, I mean, I'm never going to get past this joint employer thing until people understand that. I can't even imagine a day where my brand would want to tell me what to do with my employees or how to do that. Certainly um, not the experience that I've had with the brand right. that I enjoy working with. Thank you, Tam. Svetlana, to go to you. What's your view of joint employer and how it plays in here? Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with Tam that you know, that the joint employer rule doesn't really benefit anyone. It doesn't benefit the the franchisee or, or the brand. Um, but there is a, a grave um, risk here that that the FTC will want to do something in this space, and that's why filing a comment is very important. Yeah, I think people are concerned also that uh, as the NLRB looks to finalize a bad joint employer policy for franchising late this summer or fall, that some of the comments written in on the, this FTC RFI could be used as justification for that. And of course, if you need more evidence of the experience of the past, you can go to a website that's still up. It's called jointemployerfacts.com, jointemployerfacts.com. And you can see how the expanded joint employer standard from the 2015 to 2017 period at the tail end of the Obama administration really impacted franchising. It really drove up operational costs, it drove up legal costs, it increased litigation, it had a chilling effect on some communication, best practice sharing between brands and franchisees out of the concern, the certainly justified concern of being named joint employers. So it certainly had an impact on the relationship uh, that's been better since 2017, but uh, we've seen this mo movie before and we may uh, be headed back there soon. Okay, one more question, and then perhaps we can open it up for a minute or two. Uh, Tam and um, uh, uh, Sarah, maybe start with you and go to uh, uh, Tam and Svetlana, get everybody's uh, uh, take here. I think we all know um, that there are bad eggs out there. There's fly-by-night operations that uh, claim to be franchises. So there's certainly an interest in uh, uh, having a uh, franchising community with integrity. So if we're saying that the FTC is not our friend here, what should franchisees uh, do that have that have uh, complaints in their system or other issues that they want to bring forward? Sarah, you first. Uh, thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, hopefully you're in a system where there are open communications between the franchisees and the franchisor, and you can engage in that sort of dialogue. Um, certainly acknowledge that that's not the case in all systems. Um, you know, again, to highlight the benefit of franchisee associations, if you're not able to communicate directly with the franchisor, um, associations are a great resource for, um, for those communications. Um, if neither of those are an option, um, IFA is, is, has been working on relaunching a program that um, is not new, is something that we previously had that was, it was temporarily suspended during the pandemic, but an ombuds program um, that is independently administered. So it's, it's not something that IFA controls or has, you know, visibility into, um, you know, details that are provided from um, callers into the ombuds program, but it's accessible for IFA members and then um, and then all franchisees. So not just franchisees that are members of IFA, although we certainly would encourage you to be part of IFA because we want your voice. Um, but you can access the ombuds program um, Hopefully, we'll have it up and, and launched again in the next um, month or so. But um, you'll be able to call in and speak with an ombuds about uh, issues you're having in your franchise system. There'll be opportunities to invite the franchisor into the conversation or vice versa um, and, and de-escalate and talk through um, resolutions to issues. Um, again, it's, it's not something that we it's all confidential, so, so we wouldn't have visibility into that. Um, and then separately from that, we're also working to establish a franchise alternative dispute resolution panel. So um, most franchise agreements have mandatory mediation provisions and then certainly ultimately, you know, dispute resolution provisions. Um, the hope of, of the franchise ADR panel is that there is you know, an, an established group of franchise attorneys that represent franchisors and franchisees 
um, from whom to choose to mediate disputes that will be an independent third party, but that has experience in franchising. That's great. Thank you, Sarah. The Ombuds Program, the Alternative Dispute Resolution Program, contact any of us at IFA for more, but that's a great way to uh, uh, solve problems, solve issues within our, our own community. Uh, Tam Svetlana, 30 seconds apiece, perhaps on uh, on your views uh, here, what uh, we should do. Start writing, open up the QR code, use the fan template, um, contact IFA offline. Let's get some comments submitted that are productive um, and more reflective of the franchisee experience as a whole. Great. Um, yeah. Echo those remarks that there are two weeks left in the in the period. So uh, please get your comments in as fast as you can. Great. I think we've dri driven up uh, a number of uh, comments on this program here. So um, we've got a minute or so left. Let's go to our moderator. I have we've processed a few of uh, these questions during our conversation, but turn to IFA's Anna Russell for any additional questions that we should uh, uh, process here. Yep, we have time for uh, one question. We have someone asking, will the IFA consolidate comments from some of its franchisors or will franchisors be expected to submit their comments individually? Great question. Sarah, you want to do that one? Sure. Um, IFA is, is preparing a response to the RFI. Um, but certainly would encourage the brands to separately respond. Um, the, the perspective is unique and, and your authentic story is important. Um, if it's an issue of responding with, under your brand name, there's opportunities for everyone to respond anonymously, not just franchisees, but do you think it's important for um, voices to be heard and all of the perspectives to be um, reflected in, in the comments and the responses. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. And thank you to uh, all our question askers. Uh, as we wrap today, uh, there's a few things to leave you with. Uh, if you need a takeaway from this program, and again, hopefully many of you submitted your comments right as you listen to Sarah, Tam, and Svetlana. But on your screen, IFA has prepared a two-page toolkit, which you can use as a takeaway um, and share with colleagues. And so if you yet another QR code on your screen, if you scan this QR code, it'll take you directly to this two-page uh, PDF on your screen that also has the links to the FTC RFI uh, and gives you an enduring artifact of this program. And then we also have a, another QR code for everyone to scan. And this one is to join the IFA's Grassroots Army. This is the Franchise Action Network. If you're on this program, clearly you're interested in these policy issues, urge you to scan this code, quickly sign up so that when we send opportunities to write letters to policymakers, uh, regulators like the FTC, you can do so with just a few clicks. And, and then my final uh, note, I believe, is that every September, uh, we uh, invite hundreds of franchise business people like Tam and many others to Washington, uh, not just to send letters to their elected leaders, but to meet with them specifically, hear from them at our conference center. And uh, that the dates for the IFA, the rebranded IFA Advocacy Summit will be September 11th to 13th. And you can count on both FTC and joint employer issues, fundamental to the franchise relationship being a big part of the conversation that week where IFA really becomes a big part of the Washington news cycle and uh, the bloodstream. So please join us in Washington during the fall when it should be, when it should be beautiful. We will uh, continue this series uh, in three weeks on June 14th, Wednesday, uh, and then uh, throughout the summer, every other week on Wednesdays uh, moving forward. Everyone, that's all we have for today. We hope you enjoyed today's discussion. Our thanks again to Tam Kennedy and Svetlana Gans for joining Sarah Bush and me on today's town hall. Thanks to all of you who joined. 
ask questions. We appreciate all of your engagement. We hope to see you again on Wednesday, June 14th for our next IFA Franchisee Town Hall call. Have a great Memorial Day weekend, everybody, and see you soon. Thank you.